Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us in this session of Maxwell Lectures, Harmonizing Judicial Approaches to Choice of Law in Arbitration Agreement. I'm Shun from Maxwell Chambers, your host for today. Our speaker who is joining us is Dr. Winnie Jumema. Dr. Winnie Jumema is an independent arbitrator and resident of the Arbitration Chambers. She is also a fellow and approved faculty member of SIA. She has over 20 years of teaching experiences with special focus on international commercial arbitration and private international law. Without further ado, let's welcome Winnie to the e-stage. Winnie, please. Hi, Winnie. Hello. Yeah. Let me hand over the e-stage to you. Thank you very much. Warm greetings from the Gold Coast in Australia. Sincere thanks to Maxwell Chambers and supporting organisation. To my mentors, friends and students, and to everyone whom I finally have the pleasure of meeting. What an honour to present this Maxwell lecture on a topic that has been on my mind for five years. It began when I was drafting the model clause for CAA International Arbitration Center, deciding whether and how to adopt this optional provision from HKIAC. This choice of law provision for arbitration agreement is recommended if the law of the seat differs from the law of the contract. Then I became aware of several legislative and institutional choice of law rules, which specify the law of the seat as the default choice for arbitration agreement in the absence of parties choice of law. However, the most common scenario remains the most complicated. Namely, the parties have not chosen a law for their arbitration agreement, and they have made different choices for their seat and for the law of the contract. Furthermore, neither the applicable law nor the institutional rules provide for a default choice of law for the arbitration agreement. The consequence is that courts worldwide may apply one of three approaches, depending on when and where the issue arises. The main contract approach favors the law of the contract. For purposes of brevity, I will use the word contract to mean the main, substantive, underlying, or principal contract which contains the arbitration clause. By contrast, the seat approach prefers the law of the seat, whereas the validation approach applies a law favorable to the arbitration agreement's validity, which may be another law. Following my book chapter and conference presentation, CAA's draft amendment to Taiwan's arbitration law added a provision to specify the law of the seat as the law of the arbitration agreement in the absence of the party's choice. Following the famous anchor case, Maxi Scherer conducted a world survey to test the assumption in ENCA that the law of the contract is the most preferred choice for the arbitration agreement. She kindly shared her papers when I informed her about presenting on this topic again. So we have most of the pieces for this jigsaw puzzle, but how do we put them together? How can we further contribute to this area of law? Alleviating the current uncertainty demands efforts by firstly, the parties to expressly specify the law for their arbitration agreement. Secondly, arbitral institutions to assist by providing such choice of law provision in their model clauses. Thirdly, institutions and even legislatures to provi provide for default choice of law. 
Last but not least, the courts to harmonize their approaches to the choice of law rule in Article 5.1a of the New York Convention. This lecture focuses on exploring the sources and causes of persisting judicial disharmony, using the disagreement within anchor case to find common denominators and thereby harmonize judicial approaches. And let's begin with your views. The question is very long, so bear with me. If the parties have not expressly chosen any law for their arbitration agreement, but the parties have made different choices for the law of the contract and the seat, and the applicable laws or rules do not provide a default choice of law for the arbitration agreement, what would be your most preferred law for the arbitration agreement? Please choose one out of the five options. Thank you. Okay, this is very interesting. According to Maxi Scherer's survey of 75 jurisdictions, only 34% support the law of the contract. So if we actually add the results for options one and B, one and two, we actually have 54% in favor of the law of the contract. Now, according to the survey, it's 51%. According to the Maxwell poll, options three and four would only amount to 32%. And the validation approach is 9%, whereas according to this poll, that's 14 percent. This is very, very interesting. So we have a majority preference for the law of the contract. Now that's going to make my job much harder, I think. Let's move on. So let's now begin by looking at the courses and sources of division, even within the audience for this lecture. The first main cause of controversy is that both the timing and characterization of issues may affect the law applicable to the arbitration agreement. This slide lists the four examples of judicial determinations from pre-arbitration to post-award stages, as well as the potential issues concerning the arbitration agreement. According to Sherrod's survey, the validity of an arbitration agreement is the most common issue at 59%. However, imagine that a court refers the parties to arbitration after deciding that the arbitration agreement is valid under the law of the seat. Yet another court subsequently refuses to enforce the final award from this arbitration on the basis that the arbitration agreement is invalid under the law of the contract. Imagine another scenario where a court upholds an arbitral tribunal's jurisdiction after determining that the dispute falls within the scope of the arbitration agreement pursuant to the law of the contract. Yet the court at the seat subsequently sets aside the award because the dispute falls outside the scope of the arbitration agreement according to the law of the seat. These two scenarios are highly undesirable but possible. If different courts at different times continue to apply different laws to determine the same or different issues of the same arbitration agreement. The second controversy is whether to apply the international choice of law rule in the New York Convention or the domestic choice of law rule, such as the proper law of the contract, as demonstrated by the disagreement within the anchor case. Apologies for the wordy slides, 
so that you can read everything in their full context. According to Article 51A of the New York Convention, the law applicable to the arbitration agreement is the law to which the parties have subjected it or failing any indication thereon, the law of the country where the award is made. By comparison, the proper law of contract according to Enker case is the law chosen by the parties to govern the contract or in the absence of such a choice, the law with which the arbitration agreement is most closely connected. As you can see, the main difference is the default choice. Article 51A refers to the law of the seat, whereas the common law approach ascertains the law with the closest connection. The income majority supports an extensive application of Article 51A, which represents international policy whereas the minority prefers the pre-existing domestic rule, which serves different policy objectives. Although the New York Convention and the Moral Law recognize the arbitration agreement to be in the form of an arbitration clause in the contract or in the form of a separate agreement. However, the type of arbitration agreement remains the third reason for the inconsistent decisions on choice of law. On the one hand, the law of the contract may be more likely to apply to an arbitration clause within a contract, especially if it is part of a multi-tier dispute resolution clause. On the other hand, the law of the seat is most likely to apply to a freestanding arbitration agreement, mm -hmm. as confirmed by judges in England and Singapore. Ideally, the same approach to choice of law should apply to all types of arbitration agreement. The fourth and related contention is Article 16 of the model law. It states, for the purpose of an arbitral tribunal ruling on its jurisdiction, an arbitration clause which forms part of a contract shall be treated as, a, as an agreement independent of the other terms of the contract. There is consensus that this principle of separability allows a separate and different governing law for an arbitration clause. It also aligns with the concept of depassage, which means splitting the contract. However, disagreement remains on whether the principle of separability also extends to separate and different choice of law rules for an arbitration clause. For instance, instead of applying the general concept of the proper law of contract, can we apply the specific choice of law rule in Article 51A of the New York Convention? The fifth cause of inconsistency is the party's choices of seat and the law governing their contract. Examples include choice of seat only, choice of law for the contract only, no choice, or same choice. For the most common scenario of different choices, Shearer's survey indicates 51 support for the law of the seat. But this Maxwell Chamber, sorry, this Maxwell lecture poll actually has 54% in favor of the law of the contract, which conforms with the majority approach in anchor case. The majority in anchor case regard the party's choice of the choice of law for the contract as an implied choice of law for the arbitration agreement. 
Yet they also add two exceptions for applying the law of the seat, one of which is where the law of the contract would invalidate the arbitration agreement. On the other hand, if the parties have only chosen their seat, the law of the seat would, according to ANCA majority, apply by default because of its closest connection with the arbitration agreement. By contrast, ANCA minority prefers to apply the general rule without any exception that the proper law of the contract is also the proper law of the arbitration agreement. The sixth contention actually arises from the proper law of the contract itself. The traditional three-step test searches for the party's expressed choice, then implied choice, followed by the closest connection as the last resort or default rule. Whether ascertaining the proper law involves three or two steps, most judges seem to regard implied choice as being closer to express choice rather than the default choice of closest connection. This is because implied choice involves interpreting the party's intention rather than imputing an intention by applying a rule of law. However, are the parties more likely to intend the same law or different laws to govern their contract and arbitration agreement? Can their choice of law for their arbitration agreement be implied from their choice of law for the contract or their choice of seat? My audience is often divided when I ask them these two questions. In any event, there should be consensus on the final step of the closest connection. The focus should be on the connection with the arbitration agreement for resolving the dispute rather than on the contract giving rise to the dispute. It follows that the law of the seat would have a closer connection with the law with the arbitration agreement than the law of the contract. Let's further explore implied choice, which is the main source of controversy, because it borderlines with, on the one hand, express or subjective choice, and on the other hand, default or objective choice. There is consensus that an express choice of law for the contract constitutes an implied choice of law for the arbitration agreement. But dissent remains on whether implied or default choice of law for the contract would have the same effect. There is also disagreement on whether an express choice of seat can be implied choice of law for the arbitration agreement, primarily because of the disagreement on whether the parties are more likely to intend the law of the seat or the law of the contract to govern their arbitration agreement. According to ANCA majority, the party's choice of seat would only trigger the application of the law of the seat in situ on the basis of the closest connection in situations where the parties have not chosen a law for their contract. Consequently, where the parties have made different choices for their seat and for the law governing their contract, courts elsewhere remain divided on the law of the contract based on implied choice or the law of the seat based on the closest connection or Article 5.1a of the New York Convention. It is interesting and ironic 
that the main divergence in anchor case is the choice of law for the contract rather than the arbitration agreement. Unlike the minority, the majority found that the parties had not chosen a law for their contract, whether expressly or impliedly. Consequently, the law of the party's chosen seat would apply to the arbitration agreement by default. As stated in my earlier publication, the flexibility and diversity of international arbitration make it virtually impossible to ascertain the party's implied choice in the absence of their express choice. Shearer's later paper resonates even more eloquently. It states, second guessing the party's hypothetical intent is often an, a vain exercise. Rather, courts should accept that the parties simply had not dealt with the question of the applicable law to their arbitration agreement and therefore should apply an objective connecting factor. This should be the law of the seat, either directly because Article 5.1a applies or indirectly as the law that is most closely connected to the arbitration agreement. On the other hand, we may be more confident with the party's unlikely intentions. The first is that the parties are, are unlikely to have the, uh, to intend that the law which governs the arbitration agreement would invalidate their arbitration agreement. The second is that the parties are unlikely to intend that more than one law would govern their arbitration agreement and produce conflicting results. This brings us to the final contention. You may recall that 9% von Scherer's survey supports the validation approach as represented by the Swiss provision on this slide. It states, the arbitration agreement shall be valid if it conforms to the law chosen by the parties or to the law governing the main contract or to Swiss law. However, this remains a minority approach of treating the validation principle as the choice of law rule itself. Instead, there is more support for using the validation principle as an exception to displace an otherwise applicable law. Although disagreement remains on whether the validation principle can only apply to the validity of the arbitration agreement or whether it is also suitable for other issues such as the scope of the arbitration agreement. More importantly, can Article 5, 1A of the New York Convention accommodate the validation principle? In particular, can the court refuse to apply the law of the seat by default if such law would invalidate the arbitration agreement? ENCA majority left open this question, whereas the minority would not apply the default rule in Article 5.1a to undermine the validation principle. My view is that the pro-enforcement policy of the New York Convention is compatible with the pro-validation approach. For instance, the courts retain the discretion under Article 5 to enforce an award even if the arbitration agreement would be invalid under the law of the seat, but not under other laws. Furthermore, Article 7 of the New York Convention provides for enforcement under a law which is more favorable than the New York Convention. This may be the validation approach or another approach 
which is even more favorable to the validity of an arbitration agreement. As for the next question about the interpretation of Article 5.1a, the Inca court was unanimous. The phrase, the law to which the parties have subjected it, means the law chosen by the parties, whether expressed or implied. If we cannot avoid the problematic concept of implied choice, then we need consensus on the circumstances which would constitute implied choice of law for the arbitration agreement. Uh, as to the question of whether the, uh, uh, the choice of law rule in Article 5.1a can apply to issues other than the validity of the arbitration agreement. For instance, Article 3, Article 2, Paragraph 3 is silent on choice of law, but specifies invalidity as the ground for refusing enforcement of an arbitration agreement. Article 5.1c is also silent on choice of law, which deals with the scope and interpretation of arbitration agreement in the context of refusing enforcement of an award. You may be pleased or surprised to hear that income majority endorses applying the choice of law rule in Article 5.1a to all issues and stages. However, courts elsewhere may not agree. In any event, the New York Convention refers to different laws for other issues that may affect an arbitration agreement's validity. These are the party's capacity in Article 5.1a, which means who can arbitrate, and subject matter arbitrability in Article 5.2a, which means what can be arbitrated. Although both capacity and arbitrability can affect an arbitration agreement's validity, however, they should have separate characterization for choice of law purposes, and therefore they should not be subject to the choice of law rule in Article 5.1a. Otherwise, the application of multiple laws may cause unnecessary complication and even conflict. We have finally reached this summary of contentions and commonalities. The top row of this table reproduces the choice of law rule in the Enker case and Article 5.1a of the New York Convention. First, regardless of whether the separability and autonomy of arbitration clause supports a separable and autonomous choice of law rule for arbitration agreement, we should avoid equating the proper law of the contract with the proper law of the arbitration agreement. We should also avoid assuming that a choice of law for the contract extends to the arbitration agreement. Second, the New York Convention can accommodate the validation principle. Third, if we cannot avoid implied choice, we can at least limit its scope, especially when we cannot truly ascertain the party's intentions. If a choice of seat cannot constitute implied choice of law for the arbitration agreement, then a choice for the contract can only be implied choice of law for the arbitration agreement in specified circumstances. Fourth, the law of the seat and the law of the contract are the two closest connections with the arbitration agreement. But the default choice of Article 5.1a is the law of the seat. Fifth, the same law should ideally govern all issues relating to an arbitration agreement, except for the party's capacity 
and the related issue of subject matter arbitrability. Six, ideally, the law governing an arbitration agreement should also remain the same at all stages of judicial determinations, from the enforcement of arbitration agreement to the enforcement of arbitral award. So this is one way of harmonizing judicial approaches to Article 5.1a of the New York Convention. It begins by asking whether there is an express choice of law for the arbitration agreement. If the answer is no, then the second question is whether the choice of law for the arbitration agreement can be implied. The law of the contract can only constitute implied choice of law for the arbitration agreement if A, we are dealing with an arbitration clause within a contract, B, there is an express choice of law for the contract, and C, there is no choice of seat or the law of the contract is the same as the law of the seat. If the answer is no, then the third question is whether the law of the seat would invalidate the arbitration agreement. If the answer is no, then the law of the seat would apply as the default choice of law for the arbitration agreement. If, however, the answer is yes, then the law of the contract or another law would apply to the arbitration agreement. This harmonized approach can apply to all types of arbitration agreement, whether it's freestanding agreement or an arbitration clause within a contract, whether it's a single or multi-tier clause. It may also accommodate all three approaches, the seat approach, the contract approach, and the validation approach, hopefully without causing complication or conflict. However, the results of applying this approach may still differ depending on the permutations of the party's choices. Admittedly, one size does not fit all, but we can at least use all commonalities to agree on as much as we can. Assuming, and this is going to be a big assumption according to our previous poll, assuming that we can agree on this approach, the next challenge is whether we can also agree on extending this approach to all judicial determinations, regardless of timing, that is pre and post award, as well as context, that is all issues except for capacity and arbitrability. So I would like to hear from you again. Would you give minimal or maximal effect to the choice of law rule in Article 5.1a? Please choose one out of the four options. Thank you. Okay. Unsurprisingly, there is no clear majority, but I think there is uh, the highest is still 38% for the most uh, conservative approach, and I would definitely agree with that. I think that would be at least a very good, uh, safe place to start. Um, anything else would be really over ambitious. But ideally, if we do agree on a harmonized approach to Article 5.1a, I think it would be nice to have option two, that is to extend that to determining the validity of an arbitration agreement for all judicial determinations in all contexts. Since I finished my lecture early, can I actually indulge on repeating the first poll? Would that be possible, Xiyin? I just wanted to see whether the results may change after the lecture. Would everyone be okay with redoing the first poll again? If I can just get back to Xiyin, is that possible? Yes, sure. I'll relaunch the poll. Thank you so much. I will move back to that particular question. So just repeating the first poll, assuming that we are again in the most common scenario, the parties have not chosen the law for their arbitration agreement. They've made different choices for their seat and the law governing their contract. 
and there's no default choice of all law. What will be your most preferred choice of law for the arbitration agreement? See if the result changes. Okay, great. Oh my goodness. We still have the law of the contract at the highest, but it's reduced to, oh, it's actually 38%. Now we have more preference for the law of the seat. Okay, that's very, very interesting, but also an increase uh, in favor of the uh, validation approach. But I suppose this poll may not really um, reflect everyone's uh, view at the end of this lecture, given that my harmonized approach actually accommodates all three approaches, but it's actually quite interesting to see how people have already changed their preferences. So um, thank you everyone for your participation in the poll. And um, I think we have a lot of questions, I hope, um, and we do have enough time to answer them. If I don't get to answer all the questions in this lecture, please feel free to email me. I have the email address here and um, I would love to keep in touch with you. Thank you so much, everyone. And um, let's now uh, have the question and answer session. Hi, Winnie. Thank Hello. you so much. Thank you so much for the insightful presentation. I'm sure the participants enjoyed the polls very much. So we'll now proceed with the Q&A segment. So um, just heads up to all participants. If you have questions for Winnie, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen to share your questions, or you may also request to speak by using the raise hand function. So perhaps um, we have uh, actually some questions. Um, first, uh, there's one from Nicholas Poon. So what law should apply to determine whether a choice has been made of a law for the arbitration agreement? Okay, so to Nicholas' question, what law should apply to determine whether a choice has been made of the law for the arbitration agreement? If you are talking about judicial determinations, I'm pretty sure the, the court would apply the law of the forum. So the court would actually apply their own law in determining whether a choice has been made for uh, the law of the arbitration agreement. But the same position may not apply to arbitrators. As you all know, in international arbitration, arbitrators are not bound by the law of any specific forum. Thank you. Okay. Yep, so we have another question from Dan Kanta. So um, he said, hi, Winnie, thanks for today's lecture. Um, so she was just wondering what you would view as the largest flaw in the law of contract as the preferred law. Okay. Hi, Dan. <laughs> nice to see you back from Bonn. Um, I know you love the law of the contract. I don't have any prejudice against the law, against the law of the contract being a, a, a law that would also, also apply to the arbitration clause. Um, but as you can see from a harmonized approach, because of the separability principle, we cannot automatically assume that the parties intend to choose the same law to govern their contract and also their arbitration agreement. But I do appreciate there is enough support for the proposition that an express choice of law for the contract would constitute implied choice of law for the arbitration agreement. But as you can see from the anchor case and many other cases, sometimes it's actually not easy to even decide whether or not the parties have chosen the law for their contract whether that's expressly or impliedly. And that was really the start of the problem in the anchor case. So I think uh, it's for those two reasons, I will be hesitant to use the law of the contract as a general rule without any exceptions. The other other compelling reason is Article 51A of the New York Convention. That article will have a uh, will apply in many, many situations. And it will be useful for the courts to adopt a choice of law rule that will be consistent with Article 51A. So this is what, what I'm trying to strive for. So I have accommodated the contract approach into my harmonized approach. So you can see it will still, it, it, there is scope for the law of the contract to be the law of the arbitration agreement. Although I have, admittedly limited the scope of its application. All right, uh, we have one, uh, 
actually two person uh, who wants mm -hmm. to speak. So um, mm -hmm. I'll just send the invite to Peter Sim. So okay, Peter sure. Sim, uh, you can actually ask his question now. Hi, Peter, how are you? Hi. Um, just practically speaking, uh, sometimes uh, some courts may want to when they're hearing the case, may want to favor, when they're looking at this uh, clauses, may want to, to favor their own country because they want to bring the litigation business to their own country, I think, which is quite fair. Um, ha have you ever experienced something like that? Um, so when decided, so in order to bring more arbitrations to their country, yeah. Um, they might be influenced um, in interpreting the choice of a rule for the arbitration yeah. agreement. I yeah. think in order to do that, I think they mm. would be inclined to choose a law that would uphold mm. the validity mm. of the arbitration agreement. So it's mm. not necessary they will say that the law applicable to the arbitration agreement will be their own law. I think mm. what they would usually do is they will probably strive to choose mm. between either the law of the seat or the law of the contract or mm. to find another law that would actually favour mm the validity yeah. of the arbitration agreement. Yeah, no, I, I understand that. I, I understand that. That, that is uh, academically speaking, but have you ever experienced something like that yourself? No, not, not yet. No. Okay, no. well, okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, so I'll move on to another question from Cameron. So um, if the law for the contract is a trans transnation law, uh, uh, for example, Lex Mercatoria, rather than a national law, can you harmonize approach work? Okay, Cameron, actually, that's a great question. The one other, there is actually a fourth approach that's known as the French approach or the international approach. According to that approach, they actually don't look at any domestic law. They look at the party's common intent or any international law. So if the law for the contract is a transnational law, the question is still whether that law would also apply to the arbitration agreement. So would that choice of international law be an implied choice for the arbitration agreement? And I think that would be quite interesting. And I think on the one hand, the court might say it is an international law and therefore uh, it is reasonable that the parties may intend the same transnational law to also apply to the arbitration agreement. And um, they may reach that conclusion and uphold the validity of the arbitration agreement as well. Yeah, but I still think that there is still a separate question as to whether that choice of law for the contract would also apply to the arbitration agreement. Great. Uh, we have another question for, from Camelia. So what are the drawbacks and benefits of each approach? Okay, the drawbacks and benefits of each approach. Um, I think I've already answered in relation to the contract approach. It doesn't sit very well with the separability principle. It's not very consistent with Article 5.1a of the New York Convention. These are just the two main examples. In relation to the seat approach, I think there are still some concerns that the seat may not be what the parties intend. Many courts and judges and maybe parties, they still think when they are choosing a law for their contract, they intend that choice of law to also extend to the arbitration agreement. Um, there's probably also another uh, a reason they might think that the, the seat already governs many other aspects of the arbitration uh, including the arbitral proceedings. Um, it may be given the law of the seat too extensive scope to govern the, the arbitration. Yeah. But I think anchor case will be a great case to look at the pros and cons, but you, you will see uh, the honors really, really set out uh, the arguments for against each approach very well in that judgment. Um, now I would like to invite another participant to speak. Uh, this is Rajesh Sharma. Hi, Rajesh. <laughs> Good evening, Vini. Um, it was an excellent presentation and uh, very informative and uh, good to learn and review everything uh, as you stated. Uh, my question is very simple, that why we are making our life so complicated? As it was before, just apply law of seat and continue with that. 
before in Inca and Sul America and all those cases which created a controversy, if we ignore that and we just follow the New York Convention and follow that, then it will be easier. So why not we just make it so simple and easy and apply law of seed? And the second, even if we are doing this harmonizing approach or courts are interpreting, uh, why don't they take any reference from the drafting history of New York Convention? Mm. Thank you. Rajesh, I really feel you. And if you will recall from my earlier book chapter and the conference presentation, I was, I agree with you. I said, let's just go for Article 51A of the New York Convention, simple. But, you know, if you look at Inca's case, and I have to say the minority, they really did um, talk about the New York Convention and the domestic, you know, the proper law of the contract, they serve different policy objectives. I mean, we may agree or disagree, but I think the reality is courts worldwide will continue to dispute whether the international policy as enshrined in Article 5.1a of the New York Convention can apply to choice of law for arbitration agreement to all issues. So I think, you know, my preference and my personal hope is at least they will all apply Article 5.1a of the New York Convention when they are determining the validity of the arbitration agreement in all stages. I think that will be very, very nice to achieve. But I think we need to be realistic. And if you look at even the anchor case, you know, you have two judges and I, and I already know there are some other judges from other jurisdictions that are supportive of their views. So I just think for reality purposes, we it will take more concerted efforts for us to convince everyone to follow Article 51A. So I have to say, I really struggle with this presentation because originally I did want to push for Article 51A, but in the end, I went for a harmonized. And as you say, it's a more complicated approach because I realized at the moment, there's no clear preference for either the contract approach or the seat approach. And there's also disagreement on the validation approach. So I thought maybe by harmonizing them, at least that will get hopefully more appreciation of the complexity and hopefully will perhaps convince them to adopt a simpler solution that is to follow Article 5.1a. Thank you. I really appreciate your uh, honest opinion <laughs> on this point. Thank you. Thank you, Rajesh. Oh, Xing, I think you're on mute. She, Xing, you are on mute. Sorry, we can't hear you. Hi. Can you hear yes, me? Yes, we can hear you now. Yes. Sorry for that. Um, so next question is from Abdullah. Is it advisable for the parties to expressly choose the law of arbitration agreement in view that the arbitration agreement may be invalid under that law? Yes, Abdullah, that's absolutely correct. Um, that's why we are really encouraging the parties to expressly provide, provide for the law governing the arbitration agreement if the parties can actually agree on that. That would prevent all the problems. But, but, but as you would appreciate, that still, you know, it's very rare for the parties to specify a choice of law provision for the arbitration agreement. But that would be the best way to prevent this mess. Yes. So another question from Yolanda. Uh, in PRC, we do not consider any implied choice when choosing the law for the contract or the arbitration agreement. So it goes directly to the law of the seat. How do you think of that? Um, I actually like that. Um, as I said, this problem only arises if there is no applicable law that provides for default choice. So if you actually, if the PIC law does apply, then the problem will be resolved. And I do understand from the PIC provision, not only do they choose the law of the seat, they also have the alternative, that is the law where the arbitral institution is incorporated. So yes, that will be another solution. That's what I mentioned earlier in my webinar. We can all resolve or prevent the problem by the parties agreeing on the express choice of law for their arbitration agreement, and also by institutions and legislatures to, prov to provide for default choice of law rule. If we can have one of those, then we don't have to go to the stage where the courts have to resolve the dispute. 
If so, uh, just another question from Michael Huang. Uh, it's a bit um, lengthy. <laughs> um, so why don't arbitration institutions take more proactive steps to remind users to expressly choose the law of the arbitration agreement uh, as opposed to the governing law of the contract? So this is what uh, HKIAC have been doing in their model clause since the CA decision in, in which, but um, he don't know how many users actually respond to this mm. invitation. So mm. he has never seen any arbitration agreement which has an express choice of law for the validity of the arbitration agreement as opposed to the governing law of the contract. Michael, I feel you, and that's why I'm urging uh, more arbitral uh, institutions to consider providing for a choice of law provision in their model clauses. And we did have that for CAI from the very beginning, but in the end, we deleted that because at that time, as you will recall, the CAA, CAI dual track system of arbitration, we didn't want to create any unnecessary complication for the parties. But now I'm actually going to recommend them to restore that choice of law provision. And everywhere I go when I teach, or when I present seminars or when I have client meetings, I do recommend them uh, providing for express choice of law. So I think that will be an effort that will come from all of us. So I do encourage everyone, uh, if you are lawyers, please do advise your clients to consider having an express choice of law for the arbitration agreement for all the arbitral institutions, considering adopting a provision in your uh, model courses or even providing for default choice of law. Yeah. Hopefully we can solve that problem. Then we don't have to go to the convoluted um, harmonized approach for the courts. But I still think that's necessary. I still think that that will be necessary to, to completely resolve the issue. So this question is from Helen Lai. So how do you, we know is for the purpose of harmonizing but not exceeding the discretionary power given to the arbitral tribunal? Okay, Helen, I'm not sure about um, your question about exceeding the discretionary power. We think the harmonized approach was actually targeted at the judges, um, not necessarily the arbitral tribunal, although they may be equally applicable to arbitrators as well. So I think um, even if an arbitrator adopts the harmonized approach, it would not exceed the discretionary power because arbitrators actually have more discretion when it comes to choice of law than judges. Yep. Uh, I'll move on to another question from Alvin Yap. So he asked, what do you think of the argument that in determining deter determining the law governing the arbitration agreement, the place where the award might be enforced should be taken into account. Thank you, Elvin, for that question. Yes, I, I, I truly think so. Yeah, and, and I think that will be quite relevant when it, both the law of the contract and the law of the seat would invalidate the arbitration agreement. And I think this is where the law of the place of the enforcement may come um, through the validation principle. The reason why I didn't really think about the law of enforcement for the award is that is also a connecting factor for determining the law of the seat. But given the reality at the moment is that the court, there is su enough support for both the law of the seat and the law of the contract. So it would be unusual for the law of the enforcement as a standalone um, choice and unless we can say it would have the closest connection with the arbitration agreement, then it will be difficult to use the law of the place of the enforcement as a standalone option. But I think there is scope if neither the law of the seat nor the uh, law of the contract would work. All right, so another question from Albert Monichino. Uh, haven't the Singapore courts rejected the validation approach, say Stephen Chong J. If so, do you think it is likely that they will change their view in the future? 
Um, I can't really crystal gaze um, about how judges in Singapore is going to change their mind, but I think when we think about the validation approach, I think we need to think about what do we mean by the validation approach? Do we mean that validation approach would allow judges to choose whatever law they like that would uphold the validity of an arbitration agreement or will be favourable to another issue for the arbitration agreement? I think that will be unlikely. But I think the more likely situation is judges may be prepared to adopt the validation principle as an exception to refuse to apply a law that would invalidate the arbitration agreement. So I think there is potential scope for the validation approach, whether that's going to be as an exception or if you really want to elevate it as a choice of law rule, I think you probably will need to look at legislative provision like the Swiss approach. You'll find in most jurisdictions that endorse the validation approach, it's actually provided by statute rather than judicial uh, endorsement. Yeah. Yep, so we have a lot of questions coming in, but um, it's, it's running slightly out of time, but I will just take on a few more questions. Um, so for the rest of questions, we'll just consolidate to uh, send it to Dr. Weenie for her answers, and then we'll send it out to all the participants. So um, next question, um, it's from Kenny Yap. So most, yeah, so most model arbitration clauses do not specify the law governing the arbitration agreement, which is suggest that arbitral institutions put in a choice of law governing the arbitration agreement. Thanks, Kenny. I think I answered a similar question um, to Michael Quinn. Yes, I would definitely recommend that arbitral institutions to consider putting an optional choice of law provision in their model clauses. And that clause is actually very short. Uh, it also respects party autonomy. But I think, you know, for first time users, it may take some effort to educate them about why we need that course. And I think that was one of the, some, that may be the main reason why some arbitral institutions choose not to do so. But I think for the more sophisticated or experienced users, that ex, uh, choice of law provision should now really make sense to everyone. Yeah. But I think it will take concerted efforts uh, from lawyers and arbitral institutions and teachers everywhere uh, to instill the need and the importance of having an express choice of law provision for arbitration agreement. So we actually have a question from Professor Lawrence Wu. So if there is no choice of law, no choice of seat, no choice of law of arbitration, how should the process for determining all these unknowns start? Ah, oh, Lawrence, I knew you would ask that. I was going to explore the question of what if there's no choice at all. And um, let's actually play that with the harmonized approach. So the first one is, is there express choice? Definitely no. Is there implied choice? No, there's no. Um, because the two obvious implied choice, we can't find them. So we are probably going to look at the third question. Is the law of the seat? Uh, going to invalidate the arbitration agreement. And I think that's where the problem starts because the seat is unchosen. So we will have to determine the seat. Okay, so assuming we can determine the seat, we then ask, then ask the question whether the law of that seat would invalidate the arbitration agreement. If the answer is no, then that would apply to the arbitration agreement. If the answer is no, then we'll probably I know you don't like the validation principle, but I think um, assuming that we can apply the validation principle, we, need, we may need to look at the last question and say, well, let's find another law, maybe the law governing the contract if we, after we determine it. If it doesn't invalidate the arbitration agreement, then we might use that to apply to the law, uh, to the arbitration agreement. What do you think? Do you have any views, Lawrence? Can we invite Lawrence to talk? Uh, perhaps let me hi Lawrence hi Lawrence if you don't mind jumping in <laughs> nope okay. hello hi 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 yeah not, nothing nothing useful to add it's just that 
uh, the uh, when everything is unknown is really where it's a starting point. You can always determine by by uh, the, the the choice of law first, mm. and then the, determine the choice of seed or the choice of arbitration agreement. I mean, the question is, where's the starting point? You know, Once you determine one, one of these elements, perhaps you can help um, uh, determine the other two elements. But really the, the difficulty is, where is the starting point? Yeah, and have you actually come across that? Because to me, the situation of no choice, to me, that's unknown, but I think it is possible but that's uncharted waters. And I think that's the scenario I really struggle with. But I think we need, as you say, we need to start somewhere. So even if we follow that particular harmonized approach, I think we need to begin by determining the, the you know, the, the seat and also determining the law of the contract before if we can get to- If there is an actual institution involved, maybe that perhaps is a good starting point, you know? Maybe it's that would be a good starting point. But if it's an yeah. ad hoc arbitration, and of course that's one of the disadvantages of uh, at home arbitration with no institution uh, being involved, then um, it's problematic. Whereas with institution, the institutions are sometimes like ICC, for example, they, they can fix the seat. So that's a good starting point. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what that's... about Alvin's point? Lawrence, how about how Alvin's point? Would you consider the law of the place of enforcement? Uh, well, there's a factor to consider, but at the, uh, depends on what stage. At the arbitration stage, and at, it, it might not. The arbitrators might be concerned with that. It will be, but it will not be an de uh, important determinant, I think, in, 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 uh, in its consideration. It's relevant, but not determinant. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry to disturb your discussion. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence, for coming on board. Perhaps um, this is almost the end of the webinar. So thank you, Winnie, for the very insightful presentation. So thank you so much, Ian. I hope you don't mind me ending this lecture by dedicating this lecture lecture to three special people. First, to Emeritus Professor Mary Hiscock for supporting my journey into legal education and arbitration. And second, to Professor Lawrence Brew, who just spoke from TAC for inspiring and enabling me to pursue career opportunities in arbitration. And finally, to the late Professor Dennis Ong, who would have been here but for his passing two weeks ago. Professor Dennis Ong was our role model of brilliance. Hopefully I will follow his blessing to become a brilliant scholar and arbitrator. arbitrator. Thank you so much, everyone. I look forward to seeing you again. Please take care. Thank you.